Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe that today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be part of. We hope to see you this Sunday morning here at City Life. Easter Sunday and April Fool's Day on the same day are an interesting combination. Some might think, oh man, Easter Sunday, the most sacred day of the year, on the least sacred day of the year. This is a tragedy. I actually think it couldn't be a better partnership because the real story of Easter turned out to be the biggest joke on the enemy, the biggest joke on death, if you will. Can you imagine, just think for a minute, what was going down? What was maybe going on? Can you imagine in the unseen realm at that very moment where everybody figured out, oh, wait a minute, I think we lost where all of a sudden it's like, guess what, death, you thought you killed God? You didn't, gotcha, April Fools. Let's jump, come on. We're jumping ahead too fast. The untold story of Easter. And today we're gonna have the Easter story probably like you have never heard it before. So if you've been in church all your life, I hope this is very different. I hope a light bulb goes on. And if you've never been in church before, if you came because somebody said you're coming to church because that's the only way you can get Easter dinner afterwards, this will be a great story for you today. And, you know, I really believe to fully understand the impact of the Easter story, we need to see it from the perspective that it was a climactic point in the story of God and man. And you can't really tell the Easter story without telling the backstory. Because without the backstory, the Easter story doesn't make sense. It's like trying to watch Lord of the Rings and having no understanding of the significance of the ring. And some of you are like, what are you talking about? My point exactly. So, in case you're not familiar with the story of God and man, and even if you are, this is the greatest story that you can never hear enough. And so this is where it got started, our first start. Boom, creation. God, creator God, made everything, and he made it good. Everyone say good. He made it good. And then he made a garden, and he put two human beings in the garden, and there was one tree that he said, don't touch. Why did he do that? It's not because he was mean. He gave a whole bunch of free reign. He gave them one rule, a whole bunch of can-dos, one can't do. But the reason he said, don't touch this tree was because he was making it clear he was giving humanity free will. Free will that they could choose to use for themselves or they could choose to do what God wanted. Unfortunately, the first two humans used their free will to choose self instead of what God wanted. And a huge mess ensued. It was all of a sudden the floodgates of brokenness, death, sin, destruction came and began to infect them and infected all of creation. But, everyone say but. God immediately begins a plan to clean the mess up, to make everything right. And his plan had a name. It was called redemption. Now, the Old Testament is God's story of working on this plan to make everything right. And in this plan, it involved a special group of people called the Nation of Israel. And you might have heard of them. They're called Jews. That's what we call them today. But there were, there were three really important, there were three key points in the story of Israel that are really important. And there were stories that 
this, this people group that they would pass on for generations. It was the stories that they told over and over and over. These three stories, they continually reminded themselves. They continually told the kids, their kids, remember the story. There were stories, these three stories were stories that God continued to tell his people and remind them of over and over. And the first one was Passover. They had been in Egypt for 400 years of slaves. God miraculously delivers them, and on the night before he delivers almost a million people out of slavery, they have this special meal. It involves some bread, some cups, and a Passover lamb that was killed and whose blood was put over the doorpost so the angel of death wouldn't kill the firstborn in those houses. And God miraculously delivers them out of their slavery. Everyone say, Passover. That's the second, that's the first story. The second story that they were reminded of a lot was in the wilderness. They were 40 years after they came out of slavery, 40 years wandering around in the desert because they were a little bit clueless. And God, but God was doing something because he was taking them from the wilderness into a place called the promised land. How many of you heard of the promised land? See, the promised land was something that God had promised their ancestors over 400 years previously. There's a special place that I'm going to take you where you're going to live. You're going to have peace. And you're going to become this great nation that's going to reflect me to the world around you. Now, God, this is a big deal. These three stories are a big deal, even if you're not Jewish. Because they represent what God wants to do in our life. God wants to bring us out of captivity. You might not, you might feel like you're in captivity. You might feel like, oh, my life is a shambles. You might not feel like you're in captivity. My life is pretty good. It's awesome. I want to tell you, without Jesus, you're in captivity. Because you could be in captivity to something as simple as self. Using your free will for self instead of to honor God. And so we are all in captivity. And God longs to bring us out of that captivity, but he he also longs to bring us into his promise. And it's a promise of peace. But in order for us to get to the promise, he has to, there's a process that he has to do something in us. He has to form us into, he has to change us into people that will actually be able to live in his goodness or to live in his promise. So, Back to the big story. As the story goes, you read, if you read in the Bible, if you've ever picked it up and tried to start reading at the beginning, and you're just like, oh gosh, what the heck is going on? From one perspective, it looks like this story is crazy. There are so many confusing things. There's a lot of blood and guts. There's a lot of wars. There's killing. There's lots of killing. There are people who, from our perspective, are just absolutely stupid. God looks angry. He comes across very, very angry most of the time. And if you're looking at this, and if you're reading this story, you're thinking, this is whacked. Like, what, what, what is this? Like, you guys say this book is a special book? These stories are special? Like, this is crazyville. But through the story, God gives us glimpses of his promises. He gives us glimpses that he still loves humanity. He gives glimpses that he is still for humanity and that God's actually still working on his plan to clean up the mess that we created back here. And so all throughout this story, there is this sense that everything is moving forward towards something. And then, boom, Jesus comes on the scene and everything changes. This is where it gets exciting. It gets really exciting. Now, even though you probably have heard this story maybe in Sunday school if you went to Sunday school or maybe, you know, you've, you know, roaming around the city at Christmas time and you see the crash or the nativity scene. And you, 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 typically our first discovery of Jesus is in a manger in a place called Bethlehem. Yes? You, if anybody familiar with that place? Okay. Even though that's where we're first introduced to Jesus, nearly everything we know about Jesus started at a particular place. And guess where it was? It was his baptism. Everything we know about Jesus, pretty well, except for two other events, it was from this place of his baptism. And his baptism, Jesus got baptized, in case you never knew that, 
Jesus himself was baptized. If you are baptized, even if it's you don't have any other excuse, it's like Jesus was baptized. What's your excuse? That's a whole other story. Jesus, Jesus at his baptism, that's where his true identity was revealed. It's where God the Father validated Jesus as his son. And he said, this is my beloved son, the one in whom I'm well pleased. It was a powerful thing because before that, nobody really kind of knew what was going on. But right at that moment, literally, when Jesus came up out of the water, there was this booming voice from heaven, this is my son, I am well pleased with him. This is why baptism is so important for us because that's where God validates us. Actually, it's where we step into the validation that God has declared over us. And right after Jesus' baptism, he was tested. 40 days, no food. And then at his weakest point, it said the devil came to tempt him. How's that for, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Boom. No food, 40 days. Test, bring it on. But the testing was preparation for Jesus' mission. Everyone say mission. Because see, out of these 40 days, Jesus passed the test. He didn't give in to the temptation. The devil came and said, if you're hungry, turn these stones into bread and you can eat. You know what? If you're so good, throw yourself off from the bottom of the, you know, the top of this mountain and God's angels will protect you. And look at all these kingdoms. I'll give them to you if you just worship me. And he's like, no, 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 no. And he passes the test. And because he passed the test, he comes out of the test filled with power and authority, and he goes public on his mission. This is really important. What was his mission? His entire mission was one theme. One theme. Believe it or not. Now, for those of you that have not been in church, don't have church background, this, this next little part right here, this next couple sentences, you just like, just don't need to pay attention because it's just kind of off your radar anyway. But for those of you that have been in church for a long time and have heard the story, you need to understand this because this is a bit different than what you've maybe believed. Jesus' mission, believe it or not, wasn't the salvation of mankind. Jesus' mission was not restoring the broken relationship between God and man. It was so much bigger. This was his mission. Mark 1, 14 to 15, describes it this way. Jesus went back into the region of Galilee. This is after he'd come out of the testing. And he began to proclaim the good news of God. He said, it's time. The kingdom of God is near. Everyone say kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is near. Seek forgiveness, change your actions, and believe this good news. He didn't say, I'm coming to clean up your sins. In fact, in another place, again, a different author wrote it this way. Jesus, he recorded Jesus' words as saying, he said, I need to preach the kingdom of God to other cities too. This is the purpose I was sent to fulfill. His purpose was to bring the good news of God's kingdom. Now, for us in Canada, in the 21st century, in Western civilization, that's like, whoop, who, what the heck? That's weird. But for these Jewish ears, the kingdom of God meant something very specific. It meant God was coming to rule and everything would be made right. When they heard this message, they had been waiting for centuries because part of their story was this understanding that even though there is this big mess, God has promised that he's going to come back. He's going to make everything new. Everything is going to be made right. God is going to be king. They had this prophecy that there was going to be this king that was going to come and rule on earth, and every wrong was going to be made right. Everything that was messed up was going to be 
fix. Everything that was broken was going to be put back together. Everything that was a slave was going to be made free. That's what they heard when they heard kingdom of God, and they're like, whoa. That's why the Jewish leaders hated Jesus. Because there's like, wait a minute. We're the keepers of this story. We're, we're the ones that are supposed to tell you when this God King shows up. But in their eyes, Jesus was a nobody. He came, his mission was proclaiming the good news that God's kingdom was coming. It was arriving. And for the next three years of his life, everything about his life, everything that he did, everything that he talked about centered on this mission. And everything, those three years, everything was leading up to this moment. His last three days on earth and the reason for what we are celebrating this weekend. So we have everything about Jesus. It starts at his baptism. The next three years is focused on his mission and it's all leading up to his last three days on earth. This moment that we are celebrating this weekend, Easter weekend. Here we go. It starts getting fun. Everything starts with one last supper with his buddies. They're having a meal together. Mike's message last week, he talked about this. If you weren't here, you can jump online, listen, watch, whatever. But they were celebrating the feast that every Jew celebrated every year, and it was Passover because it was remembering back to what God had done. And God had ordered, he commanded the Jews, you need to celebrate this Passover because it's a picture. It's like a photograph, and I want you to remember it forever. Because it's a picture of what God was now getting ready to do in flesh and blood through Jesus. Because Jesus was becoming the Passover lamb that would give his life to deliver humanity from a slavery that was worse than Egypt. It was a slavery to sin and death. So Jesus is having this supper with his buddies. And then afterwards, they go out to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And where Jesus, he prays. And it's not just any prayer. He is praying so intently. It says he sweat, sweats, drops of blood. And the reason he's praying so intently is because he knows what's coming. And he's saying, Father, he, Jesus is in a wrestling match with his own will because he knows exactly what is ahead of him. And he's praying to his father. He's like, Father, if there is any way, if there is any possible way that everything that's coming down, if we could do it a different way, please, 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 could we do this differently? But nevertheless, Father, not what I want. Let your will be done. And so while they're still out there, right after Jesus was done praying, one of his best friends that had been with him for the last three years came up, betrays Jesus. He kisses him on the cheek because it was a sign that this is the one, soldiers, this is the one priest. You're supposed to take this guy that I kiss, haul him away. And that's exactly what happened. And so his best friend comes up, kisses him on the cheek. They haul the soldiers and the religious leaders haul Jesus into this mock court, and they start throwing all of these false accusations against him. They're trying to find something to stick. Nothing can stick, so they make up these lies. And finally, he appears before the Roman government, and he's sentenced to death by crucifixion. And we come to the cross, which is the hinge of history. Because it wasn't just Jesus' death that played out on the cross. The cross became the battleground where a perfect, sinless man, 100% God, 100% man, would literally take on, he would become sin. And we have a story video that media is going to roll. And I want you to listen to it. It's a very different portrayal of what you've maybe heard or read about what happened at the cross. But go ahead, media. Let's roll this. I stared again at the piece of wood. My cross, I said faintly. 
You are but a piece of wood, but you are about to destroy creation itself. Again, I spoke into the unseen realm. Meet me here, principalities and powers. Come, it is your destiny to meet me at my cross. Deep within me, I silently cried out, O oh my Father, what is about to happen? Do not let it be hindered by my will. As one soldier pressed my wrist, another steadied the nail. Then came the dull thud of a hammer smashing the nail as it ripped through one wrist and then the other. As silently as a lamb being led to the slaughter, I uttered not a word. Only eyes which can see that which cannot be seen could know the drama that next began unfolding on the hill. Mass, space, and time came to a halt. I was now looking into the gathering of creatures that man's eyes cannot see. Draw near, Lucifer. Draw near, sin. Draw near, world system. Take your place before my cross. I have a question to ask you whom I've summoned here. Has it passed your notice who you are? We are your enemies, announced Sin, and we are here to watch you die. I have no enemies here, I responded. Those of you who are here have never been my enemies. You are the enemies of mankind. You are those who have distracted the race of Adam. Never for a moment have any of you been my enemy. But you do have an enemy, corrected Sin. Come, death, cried Sin. Death, your hour has arrived, I whispered. Come forth from the netherworld. Let us speak to one another, death, before we both die. Death began its speech. Ah, we meet again, one who's called God. Now behold me, your enemy. I am your victor. Death, are you finished with your self-exaltation, I asked? Of this one thing, you are correct. This is the final battle, life versus death. Out of his mind with perverse joy, death began to chant, my hour, my hour, the last hour ever there shall be. Death, I ask if you can kill me. Yes, yes, he froths with insane delight. I can, I can. At that moment, the cup appeared. It was point to pour its contents into me. The rage of all sin began to fill every cell in my body. My heart, then my mind began to falter. I, who never sinned, was suddenly becoming one with sin. My end was at hand. I had not only taken sin into me, I was becoming its incarnation. I knew my life could not long endure. In a moment, I would not be human. I would be sin. I lived before you ever existed, I said to death as he squeezed me into his clutches. Poor death. There are things that took place before you existed of which you know nothing. Death, be my servant. Put to death all that is now one with me. Adam's race, all that was touched by the fall, creation itself, principalities, powers, religion, and sin. Die upon my cross. Come all of you, die in me. You have now encountered the most destructive power in creation, my cross. Put me to death, I command you death. All that is created is crucified in me. And death, as you take the last breath from me, I have a surprise for you, death. You are now mine, I cried triumphantly. I am life at this moment. I am death to you. Today I kill you, death. You thought you came for me, but it is I who came for you. When death is dead, creation meets its end. And if death be dead, then who shall hold the graves? There will be life for all who were once your prey. Death began to feel his power draining away. His eyes blazed in horror. I have crucified the world. I have crucified sin. I have crucified the race of Adam. I have crucified creation and all else that this hour has entered into me. Death screamed as he sank into his grave. I watched all creation and all within it die upon my cross. And then I heard the voice of my father. Well done, my dear and faithful son. Hearing my father's words, I cried out, It is finished. In the last second of life, I released my divinity to the father. Father, into your hands, I entrust my spirit. Oh. The cross wasn't just symbolic meaning 
It wasn't just something that happened that meant something else. At the cross, something was happening. Something that literally changed the seen and the unseen realm for forever. Because, see, the cross was God's means to deal with sin, with evil, with all sin, with all evil. Not just my sin. Not just my bad stuff. All sin, all evil, the power of sin and evil behind it. But it gets better because Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose again, and everything that was evil, every form of darkness and sin stayed with him in the grave. And that's what we are celebrating today. We are celebrating Resurrection Sunday. When Jesus took sin, he took sickness, he took death, he took all our failures to the grave. They stayed there. He rose again in power, and today we celebrate. So you need to get just a little bit excited. This is better than the Oilers winning the Stanley Cup. Hello. Way better. Way better than your seven-year-old winning their tournament. This is exciting. God's plan of redemption had been accomplished at the cross. God was now, he had dealt with everything. He was now able to declare over humanity, not guilty, sins forgiven. You're at peace with me. You are free. Jesus had regained all power and all authority, and he had triumphed over sin and death. But there was something more. Because Jesus had begun the great reversal. How many of us? Wish you could hit the reset button on a few things in life. A few relationship choices, a few stupid decisions when you had a little bit too much of a certain substance in you. Maybe how you spoke to somebody. How many of you wish you could just hit the undo button? So here's the question. Was there a way for God to hit the reset button and start everything over again? Well, here's the thing. If you're God, anything is possible and nothing is impossible. And this is exactly what Jesus started. Because what he accomplished was for all of humanity. Because, see, at the start of his ministry, he was baptized in what was called the Jordan River. Which was actually the same river that God's people crossed over into when they were coming into the promised land. Exact same spot. And, the pro- and crossing over the Jordan for Israel, it represented them coming into a brand new beginning. Into a brand new start. Into where they were going to be this powerful nation. But where Jesus at his baptism, where God was declaring over him, this is my son whom I love. What Jesus was doing... He was doing that for every single human being. And when God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, God was saying, this is my beloved son. You're my beloved kids. You're the ones that I love, irregardless of whatever you do and don't do. I love you, irregardless. But right after his, the Jordan River, his baptism, Jesus was led into the wilderness for 40 days representing the 40 years where Israel was tested. But Jesus was so much better because a new man passed the test in the wilderness. Israel, all they did in the wilderness was complain, argue, and rebel against God. But Jesus, he passed the test in the wilderness. And he came out in strength and power. And he started to declare God's kingdom. And then he finds himself at a final meal. With his disciples, the Passover meal, where they were rehearsing what was about to take place. Because Jesus was becoming the Passover lamb. And see, Jesus was doing something so much greater. He was at this Passover. He was. He took the bread and he took the cup and he was explaining to them the story. This is a Passover story is how you know it, but it's so different now because I'm becoming this sacrifice. And right after their supper, they went to another garden. And we find ourselves right back at the beginning of the story where two other human beings were facing a test in a garden. What would they choose? See, the first two human beings in the garden 
chose self will over God's will. But the new Adam, Jesus, said, not my will, Father, but yours be done. And then another tree. Jesus was tested at a tree because the first two human beings failed the test at a different tree. See, old Adam failed the test and a living tree brought death. But Jesus, new Adam, passed the test and a dead tree, a piece of wood called the cross, brought life. Isn't that powerful? One brought what two trees. One caused life to death. The other caused death to life. And on the cross, when Jesus said the words, it is finished, he was saying the work of redemption is accomplished. Nobody else can do any more work to do it all over again. And it was the same way. After he went, after he said it's finished, they took his body, they put him to rest in a tomb. And it's just like God, after seven days of creating, it said, it is finished. It's good. I am done. And God rested on the seventh day. But this is where it gets so exciting because Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He resurrected. And we are right back at new creation. See, Jesus rising from the dead wasn't just God saying, you know what? I'm making humanity brand new. No, God was saying, I hit the reset button, everybody. Boom, it's all brand new. I have started something called new creation. God has begun the great reset, and he longs to make all things new. The great reversal. And my question for you today is, what do you need God to make new in your life? Because this is what this means. See, new creation means God can make you brand new. God can't reverse. He can't give you a brain wipe and you forget all of your bad mistakes. You can't have all of those things wiped away. But you know what? He can make you new inside just like it never happened. He can give you a peace that will replace all turmoil. He can make you so free your previous years being held captive by abuse, by regret, by guilt and shame. They can almost pale in comparison because of the peace and the strength that you feel inside now. See, what do you need to make him new? Put in your faith and trust in Jesus isn't just about believing that someday things will be better someday he'll do it no putting your faith and trust in Jesus is believing that Jesus is now rescuing that Jesus is now healing that Jesus is now restoring you that Jesus is now transforming you he is now freeing you see Easter is about celebrating a now Jesus not a someday Jesus we've had too much someday someday it'll be better someday I'll get over this someday I'll be free someday I'll be strong someday I'll be married someday I'll get to have sex someday I had to put that in there just to wake some of you up Someday, we live too much in a someday, someday. But you know what? Jesus is a now Jesus. And there is something new that started at his resurrection. And this is what we put our faith in. Our faith isn't just to have our sins forgiven. That is low level. We put our faith and trust in Jesus that what he started is brand new. And it can be new for you. It can be new for your family. It can be new for your kids. Are you ready to say yes? Jesus, I want this story. Let's stand. I want to pray. When we say yes to Jesus, we're not just saying yes to relationship with him. We're saying yes to something so much bigger. We're saying yes. I want to be part of this story. I want to be a part of the great reversal. I want to be a part of the new thing that you're doing. I want to be a part of making things new, not just in my own life, not just for my family. I want to be a part of making things new for people in our world. I want to be part of making things new for my boss who drives me crazy. I want to be a part of making things new for those kids at school who just treat me like crap. God, I want to be a part of making things new for my family who's just broken and dysfunctional. God, I want to be a part of making things 
things new in a world that is still broken. It needs to know that there's something new that was started. I want you to close your eyes and I want to pray. And we're going to pray a prayer of saying, yes, Jesus. I want the story to define my life. I'm saying yes to new creation. I'm saying yes to believing that you hit the reset button and you're making things new. And I want us to all pray this prayer out loud because there's something powerful that God wants to, he wants to bring alive for you. He wants to bring you alive in a powerful way because if you've never said yes to Jesus, this powerful story is waiting for you to step into it. It's there for you. It's already in play. It's just waiting for you to decide, I'm going to be one of the characters in the story. And let's pray this prayer together. Say, Father, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for calling me into the story that you are writing. And I say yes to Jesus. Jesus, I declare you are Lord. You are my King. I say yes to the story that you started. I want to be a part of the mission that you started. I want to be a part of making all things new. God, thank you. God, we thank you. God, we thank you that we can be a part of this story. We thank you that we can be a part of your mission, being carriers of your good news. And God, we love you and we thank you for what you're doing today. And God, I just pray for any here, Father, that really need that evidence of a reset. Father, right now I speak peace. God, right now I speak just a stilling of the storm inside. I speak freedom. God, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from regret. God, I declare your peace right now coming like a blanket to strengthen, to reassure, to reaffirm. And God, we give you thanks and praise in your name. Amen. Come on, church. Let's give God thanks today. God, thank you. God, thank you. God, we thank you. You are so good. Amen. Have a seat. Awesome. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. And we look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.